If you want to avoid ever losing points on exam day about this high yield topic on rotator cuff muscles, then all you have to do is dedicate 17 minutes and watch this entire video and you will never get another question wrong again. In this review, we're going to take a closer look at what are the rotator cuff muscles, which nerves innervate them, what are the functions or actions of these muscles, some high yield mnemonic so that you will never forget the rotator cuff muscles, and high yield questions so that you can prepare for exam day. So you can remember the rotator cuff muscles with the mnemonic SITS. S stands for supraspinatus, I, infraspinatus, T, teres minor, S, subscapularis. So now that you know all four rotator cuff muscles, what's extremely high yield is to know their actions or functions. And you can remember this with these letters, A, E, E, I, A, E, E, I. So the letters correspond to the rotator cuff muscles that they're next to, right? So for supraspinatus, its function is AB abduction. Infraspinatus, that muscle's action is external rotation or lateral rotation. Teres minor's action is also external rotation or lateral rotation. And for subscapularis, its function is internal rotation or medial rotation. So already you know all the rotator cuff muscles and their functions or actions. All you have to do is remember SITS, A-E-E-I. Another important function is AD adduction. Teres minor and subscapularis are the muscles responsible for AD adduction. So let's say it together. You can remember the rotator cuff muscles with SITS. S. Supraspinatus, I. Infraspinatus, T. Teres minor, and S. Subscapularis. You can remember their functions with A. E. E. I. A. A. B. Abduction performed by supraspinatus. Infraspinatus does external rotation or lateral rotation. Teres minor does external rotation as well. And AD adduction. While subscapularis does internal or medial rotation and AD adduction. You can pause the video right here so that you can take some time to commit this to memory. Now let's take a closer look at supraspinatus. It is the most commonly tested rotator cuff muscle because it is most commonly injured in a rotator cuff muscle injury or tear. Everything that you need to know about supraspinatus can be broken down into three main categories. The nerves that innervate it, its actions, and its attachments. So supraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve. That should be pretty easy to remember. Supraspinatus, suprascapular nerve. And its actions. So it performs the first 15 degrees of arm AB abduction. Don't worry, I'll show you an image of this soon. But that is an extremely high yield fact that you need to know. That supraspinatus initiates abduction. So for its attachments, this is the lower yield aspect of it, but it can still be tested. Supraspinatus originates from the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula, and it attaches to the greater tubercle of the humerus. So like I said before, the fact that supraspinatus initiates arm abduction and is responsible for the first 15 degrees of it, that is extremely high yield to know. So let's take a closer look at arm abduction because examiners love to test this concept. So here are some high yield facts. For the first 15 degrees of arm abduction, this is completed by supraspinatus. The supraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve. And this Stickman image right here shows you the first 15 degrees of arm abduction. So that is away from the body. 
And after the 15 degrees of arm abduction, another muscle has to take over. And that is the deltoid muscle. So the deltoid muscle is responsible for 15 to 90 degrees of arm abduction. And the deltoid is supplied by the axillary nerve. If you want to abduct your arm greater than 90 degrees, then two muscles are responsible for this action. They are the serratus anterior and the trapezius. The serratus anterior is supplied by the long thoracic nerve, while the trapezius is innervated by the accessory nerve. It is extremely important to know that the serratus anterior is innervated by the long thoracic nerve because in patients who have to do a mastectomy and especially a lymph node axillary dissection, they can get injury of this long thoracic nerve. And if that nerve is injured, then what can happen is this wing of the scapula that you can see in this image here. So I have a pretty easy mnemonic so that you can never forget this. All you have to remember is salty wings. Salty wings. So SA in salty for serratus anterior, LT for long thoracic, that is the nerve that innervates the serratus anterior, and wings to remember that if this nerve is injured, then you can develop a winged scapula. In order to test the supraspinatus, you can do the MTCAN test, which is seen in this image here. If you perform this test and it elicits pain, then that is a positive test and more than likely the supraspinatus is injured. Now that you know everything about the supraspinatus and everything about arm abduction, let's move on to the infraspinatus muscle. So there are three main things that you need to know about the infraspinatus. The nerve that innervates it, its actions and attachments. So the infraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve. Its action is external rotation or lateral rotation. For its attachments, it originates from the infraspinatus fossa of the scapula and attaches to the greater tubercle of the humerus. Even though the attachments are lower yield, they are pretty easy to remember. Because if you recall the supraspinatus, it originated from the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula, while the infraspinatus originates from the infraspinatus fossa of the scapula. And both of those muscles attach to the greater tubercle of the humerus. Now let's move on to the teres minor. Again, we'll focus on the three main categories, nerve innovation, actions, and attachments. So the teres minor is innervated by the axillary nerve. Recall that when we were discussing arm abduction, there was another muscle also innervated by the axillary nerve. Do you remember what muscle that was? Well, if you said the deltoid muscle, then you are correct. So the teres minor and the deltoid are both supplied by the axillary nerve. The action of the teres minor is external rotation or lateral rotation. For its attachments, it originates from the posterior surface of the scapula and attaches to the greater tubercle of the humerus. Another important action that you need to know for teres minor is that it adducts or AD adducts the arms. So even though the teres minor and the deltoid are both supplied by the same nerve, they perform different actions because the deltoid is responsible for the 15 to 90 degrees arm AB abduction, while the teres minor is responsible for AD adduction. So the last rotator cuff muscle is the subscapularis. Again, three main groups to look at here nerve innervation, actions, and attachments. So the subscapularis is innervated by the subscapular nerve. Its action is internal rotation or medial rotation. For its attachments, it originates from the subscapular fossa of the scapula and attaches to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So as you can see so far, all of the muscles in the rotator cuff muscles were being attached to the greater tubercle of the humerus. 
but the exception to this is the subscapularis. Another high yield thing to note is just like the teres minor, the subscapularis is also responsible for arm AD adduction. So now that we went through a general overview of all of the rotator cuff muscles, let's point out some high yield facts for you to remember. So the first one is that all of the rotator cuff muscles originate from the scapula. Recall that the infraspinatus originates from the infraspinatus fossa of the scapula, while the supraspinatus originates from the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula. And that is true for all other rotator cuff muscles. Another high yield point is that all of them attach to the greater tubercle of the humerus except for one muscle, which is the subscapularis. Next, it's important to remember the supraspinatus and infraspinatus because they are both innervated by the suprascapular nerve. And their name also tells us the origin on the scapula, like I said before. Supraspinatus originates from the supraspinatus fossa of the scapula. And the next important thing to note is external or lateral rotation are actions performed by the infraspinatus and teres minor. Examiners love to test this concept by saying, hey, the patient had an injured teres minor what other muscle would be hypertrophy due to overuse? And the answer would be the infraspinatus because they both perform external or lateral rotation. So if one is injured, the other will try to compensate for that injury. And the same can be said for arm adduction. Recall that subscapularis and teres minor perform arm adduction. Now let's do a rapid fire review. Which nerve innervates the muscle that initiates arm abduction? The suprascapular nerve. Recall that the supraspinatus initiates arm abduction and is innervated by the suprascapular nerve. Question two, what other rotator cuff muscles is innervated by this nerve? The infraspinatus. Question number three. The infraspinatus is injured. What other muscle can perform its action? The teres minor. Recall that the infraspinatus and the teres minor perform external or lateral rotation. Question number four. What rotator cuff muscle attaches to the lesser tubercle of the humerus? The subscapularis. Recall that all rotator cuff muscles attach to the greater tubercle of the humerus except for the subscapularis. Question number five. What is the action of the subscapularis? internal or medial rotation. All you have to do is remember sit and A, E, E, I, and you will remember that subscapularis performs internal or medial rotation. It is also responsible for arm adduction or adduction. Okay, now let's do two NBME style questions. A 44-year-old female with breast cancer underwent a radical mastectomy with axillary lymph node dissection. Post-op exam reveals asymmetry in her shoulder blades. What structure is affected? A. Her right scapula. B. Her left scapula. C. The latissimus dorsi. Or D. The right deltoid. So the answer is A, the right scapula. That is the one that is winged. So remember, salty wings, SA, serratus anterior, LT, long thoracic nerve, which is the nerve that interfaces the serratus anterior. And injury to these structures can cause a winged scapula. Okay, next question. Which of the following may occur as a result of this fracture? 
A. Loss of arm abduction greater than 90 degrees. B. Loss of sensation over the radial and dorsal forearm. C. Weakness with adduction and external rotation. D. Winged scapula. To know the answer to this question, you would have to know what, what muscles attach to the humerus and what are their functions. So option A is not the answer because the muscles responsible for greater than 90 degrees of arm abduction are the trapezius and serratus anterior, which are not attached to the humerus. Option B describes the innervation of the radial nerve, which would be most commonly affected for mid-shaft fractures. While option D, a wing scapula, relates to the serratus anterior, which again is not attached to the humerus, so it would not be affected by a humeral fracture. So that leaves us with option C, weakness with adduction and external rotation. The muscle responsible for these actions is the teres minor. And to learn even more Hayu concepts, then just click this video right here.